Good morning, church. Um, this is a great opportunity to once again worship our Lord and our God in spirit and in truth. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the elders and the congregation for giving me the, the opportunity to share uh, the message this morning. And uh, um, before the message, let's uh, go to our God in a short prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this uh, beautiful day that you created for us. We thank you for your amazing grace that you made us uh, this life that we enjoy. We thank you for the new life that you've given us this morning to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth and to hear a portion of your word. Father, we pray that you'll guide your servant as he delivers your message this morning and may uh, uh, we may understand it better and live it in our lives. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for our shortcomings. And we thank you for your, for your loving grace and mercy upon us. All of this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Alex, for reading the um, scripture this morning. But once again, I would like uh, to read it as we begin the message. I entitled it, The Amazing Grace of God. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 6, is the uh, scripture that I chose. And it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That little phrase on that scripture, by grace you have been saved, you have been saved, tells us all about the lesson this morning. It is the grace of God that we are here today. So how do we define grace? Grace is the grace of God, is His mercy, is His, his favor in our lives, is his, his gift of salvation. As Christians, we hear about God's grace on a regular basis, but do we fully understand its meaning and its importance? Ephesians 1 7, Paul wrote, In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. It means in him, in him is Jesus. Through the redemption, through his, we ha, through, the, through his blood in the cross, our sins were forgiven. And in accordance with the riches of God's grace. From that scripture, we can derive the verse uh, on this from that scripture, we could derive this acrostic. It says, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. In other words, God's blessing at Christ's expense. What is grace? On a Christian perspective, grace is the courteous goodwill of God to mankind. It is the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the gift of blessing. Now, the opposite of grace is disgrace. It is the state of being out of favor, exclusion, exclusion from favor or confidence, or trust. Grace is God's forgiveness. Grace is God's kindness 
and goodness. Grace is God's understanding. God's grace was displayed from the beginning of creation. It's God's goodness and power. His providence is grace in action. We can read that on Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The very beginning of all creation, we see the first glimpse of God's grace. The light, the sky, the waters, the dry lands, vegetation, animals, and the first man. All of these are God's plan for the purpose of His pleasure. God gave man dominion over all His creation because of His love. Because God is love. And as life on earth continues, we could read on Genesis 6, verses 12 to 13, on how Noah found grace in the, in the eyes of the Lord. Weakness and evil were so rampant in the hearts of men during that time. And God was ready to wipe them out entirely. But there was one man who was righteous, faithful, and committed to walking with God. Noah was not a perfect man, yet God chose to save his family from destruction. That's grace. Another example of God's grace is uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. God's grace endures in spite of Abraham and Sarah's unbelief. God made a, a note and a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, chapter 3, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. It says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you know that Abraham's fear and sense of self-preservation led him to distort the truth by saying Sarah was his sister? Remember the incident in Egypt? He tried to save his own self. Did you know that Sarah laughed when God said to her that she will give birth to a son in her old age? And then after laughing at God, she encouraged her husband to sleep with another woman to fulfill the promise. Abraham and Sarah's lives were marked with disbelief and disobedience. And yet, God remained faithful to his promise. That's grace. And also, the example of Joseph, Genesis 37 and chapter 37 until chapter 50, we can, read, we can read this in our own study. God's grace for Joseph gave him strength and persevere. On uh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he's, he, he told his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. As Joseph's story unfolds, it is difficult to see God's grace in, in it all. Despised by his brothers, sold into slavery, wrongly accused, left to rot in prison. But that's not all that how Joseph saw things. He reveals his perspective in Genesis chapter 45, verse 7, when he said, But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God used difficult and trying circumstances to position Joseph as the savior of his people. We can see that as the providential grace. How about Moses? Moses doubted God at every turn. 
yet God graciously guided him. Exodus 4, verse 13, But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else to do it. Yes. <clears throat> Moses was as flawed as the others, arrogant, stubborn, doubtful. Yet God faithfully walked with him. And as time passed, Moses learned how to faithfully obey God. God used this blemished shepherd to lead his wayward sheep out of captivity. God chose to listen and walk with this man who in his youth killed another man with his bare hands. And yet, God used him to lead more than 2 million Jews out of Egypt. That's God's grace. And then again, the Israelites repeatedly rebelled against God, yet he graciously rescued them. Judges 10, verse 16. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And he could bear Israel's misery no longer. You know, reading the story of the Israelites in the desert, I tried to keep track on how often the Israelites grumbled against God, broke his commands, worshipped false idols, and etc. But I quickly lost count. Time and again, they turned away from God, did whatever they wanted, lost God's protection, suffered great consequences, returned to God, and begged him to rescue them over and over and over again. Sometimes there were lasting consequences for their poor decisions, but God showed them more grace than was deserved over and over again. Now, let's look at some examples on the New Testament, where the New Testament is the grace of God fulfilled or manifested. Who would forget the parable that Jesus told the people, the parable of the prodigal son. Well, this is an example of God's grace, grace displayed to us. For a long time, I thought the theme of the story of the prodigal son was forgiveness. This message seems apparent from the son's self-confession in the pigsty and the father's consequence expands when he returns home. However, the more we study the parable, the more we are convinced that the theme is grace. The father gives the son his inheritance even while he is still alive. Asking for an inheritance while the father was still alive was the ultimate act of dishonor. In the face of absolute rejection, the father gives a gift that may disrupt his own livelihood. When the son returns to the father, the father notices, notices him from a distance, runs to him, and embraces him. He does not allow the son to finish his confession because full restoration has already been granted. This act would have been culturally and completely unexpected after what the son had done. Before the son goes to the father, he expects to be treated as a hired servant at best, yet he is given back his full status as a son. The father holds nothing back to receive or to celebrate his child. That is how our Father in heaven loves us. He offered us grace and reconciled in him, with him, and to be called his children. Grace is the whole theme of the New Testament. Jesus came to earth for the ungodly. Remember Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the tax collector found in Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. On this verse, God said to him, today, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of God, is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's God's grace, sending His only Son to give grace to the lowly in spirit. 
How about the healing of the blind man? In Mark chapter 8, verses 20 to 25. Jesus healed the blind man from birth. The man didn't do anything to make it this happen. It was grace through and through. Even the Pharisees could not make this into something it wasn't. There was nothing they could do or say to undo the mercy and grace Jesus imparted to the man. Grace wholly undeserved, yet richly given. How about the story of the woman in the well? John 4:26, 4, 26. 4, 4 to 26. This woman was married several times, but Jesus didn't condemn him in the well. Yet, Jesus gave her the chance to renew his life and to follow God. How about the woman found caring Carry, uh, found committing an act of adultery, John 8, uh, verses 3 to 11. Jesus didn't condemn the woman. She said, go and sin no more. She, she let her uh, get the opportunity to live a, a new life, a new life with, uh, with the belief in God and sin no more. And then... Now, uh, how can we receive God's grace? With all those examples that we've seen from the Old Testament and from the New Testament, how Jesus manifested grace. Let's come back to the scripture. But God being rich in mercy because of the, the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive, again, alive together with Christ. But Christ, you have been saved. But by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But how can we receive grace from God? Is there a formula to receive grace? Let us recall Paul's teachings for the Romans where grace was misunderstood. Romans 5.20, they're concerning about the law. It says, the law was brought in so that the trespass, which means sin or offense, might increase. But where sin, but where, where sin is there, a grace increase all the more. But do not be misled. You know, as Romans 6, verses 1 to 2, what shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? says, by no means. On some translations says, God forbid, or of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? God disciplines his children. And sometimes discipline is very painful. Well, we will ask, well, if God is love and he loves me and he's a God of grace, what is this discipline's business? What is this discipline business? If God did not discipline us when we sin against Him, that wouldn't be a God of grace. That's not kindness. That's not goodness. That's not love. Allowing us to get down with something that when God knows that will cause us to ultimately destroy our lives is not possibly an act of grace. It is an act of careless indifference. That's not who he is. He is a God of grace. That is why we should always check ourselves from our past sins, making sure that it is not lingering around for it can turn us away from God. The enemy is crafty and you can be fooled. Hebrews 3, verse 12, says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. When we are living under God's grace, sin should not be lingering in our heart. For if we continue to sin, it is just a matter of time where we will fall from grace. God's grace is offered 
for all. Titus 2.11 says, For by grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It says to all people. However, it is not received by all. So how can we receive God's grace? James tells us how. James 4, verses 6 and 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So let us now take a closer look at what James had to say. A Christian, as Christians, and to receive grace and to live in grace, we must be humble. We must submit to God. We must resist the devil. We must draw near to God. We must cleanse our hands from our daily sins. We must purify our hearts from our past sins. And we must mourn. We must repent. So James concluded by returning to the point on humility. First Peter verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, that is when the Lord returns, he may exalt you. <clears throat> so what motivates people to love God? What motivates people to serve God? What motivates people to live a Godly life? What motivates us to love God is the love of God itself. What motivates us to serve Him is His grace, His goodness, His love, and His kindness to us. That's what motivates us. And because we look forward to that day, 1 Peter 1, 3 says, 1 verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, let your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Salvation is only possible through the grace of God. But we must do the will of God to receive it. Therefore, let us humbly submit to the Lord in faithful obedience so that He will exalt us or glorify us at the proper time. So in conclusion, the grace of God is the God's unmerited favor and mercy. This is the grace we are saved by through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God can therefore empower or give us authority and sanctify us and make us holy. Without the grace of God, we would all die in our sins and never have any chance to be able to enter into heaven after this life. Without the grace of God, we will not have the power to overcome sin and the temptation to keep on sinning. Without the grace of God, we will never find what our true divine destinies are going to be in, in the Lord and what we were really created to be in this life. Without the grace of, life, of God, we will never be able to live harmony, in harmony and in unity with ourselves, with our families, our friends, and our neighbors. In other words, without the grace of God working in our, working in our lives, there's no value or meaning of life. We will never accomplish anything of any real worth. So without the grace of God working in our lives, there is no value on me of life. We will never accomplish anything of any real worth as far as the Lord is concerned. That is why Jesus has already told us that without Him, we can do absolutely nothing in this life. 
not only can the grace of God save us from the fires of everlasting pain and punishment and torment, but the grace of God can also give us the power and the ability to become everything that He is calling us to become in, in Him in life. Blessings comes as a result of God's grace. Here's the Bible teaches in order for us to regain God's grace. Repent from your sins and be willing to admit that you are a wretched sinner and only Jesus can save you from your sin. 1 John 1 and 9. And then be willing to enter into a full and complete surrender of your entire life with the Lord so that He can fully free to guide you into His perfect plan and a destiny for your life. Luke 9, 23. And then Luke 3, verse 13, it says, But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Here is where our fellowship takes effect or work. How to encourage each other? By just always being there every meeting. Your presence is more than enough encouragement anybody could ask for. Actually, Luke was suggesting daily encouragement. We can always do or think of a way to reach out and encourage someone, especially for those who are the household of our faith, that is, you and me. Do all this and you will find grace and power of God coming into your life with a passion and with an intensity that you will never have known before. God and His grace can enter into your life and change it for the better if you are willing to accept it. Work with it and then continue in it to the day you die and depart from this life. The grace of God is freely given to us. It has been offered to us for the taking and live a life serving God. He will never leave us nor forsake us for we are standing on His promises if we must only trust and obey. Galatians 1 verse 3 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all for your kind attention and remember that God loves you. Thank you.